This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, creators of the annual Brewers Retreat. To brew on the main coast June 9th through 12th with legends like Vinny Salerzo of Russian River, get tickets now at brewersretreat.com. It's another episode of the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Bogner, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. My guest on the podcast today is Brian Selders, the brewing ambassador and former head brewer of Dogfish Head Brewery and uh, uh, former brewmaster of The Post in uh, Colorado. Uh, We're going to get into a conversation here in a minute. Welcome, Brian. Well, thank you for having me. Before we get started, I just want to uh, you know, give a quick shout out to our sponsors. As the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, G&D Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, reliability, and dedication to their customers' craft. For 25 years, G&D has led the way on innovative solutions that match their brewing customers' immediate and future needs. G&D backs every project they touch and provides service second to none. Contact G&D Chillers today for your chiller sizing needs at 1-800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by the Craft Brewers Conference and Brew Expo America, America's largest craft brewing industry gathering. Join your peers in Denver, April 8th through 11th. Details at craftbrewersconference.com. All right. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Of course. Uh, it was uh, wonderful enjoying a dinner last night with you at uh, uh, Big Beers Belgians Barley Wines Festival in Breckenridge, uh, I, the Calibration Dinner, uh, an annual tradition. Uh, this was my second year being part of the uh, Calibration Dinner, and uh, it was spectacular. I think your uh, emceeing of the event was uh, top notch. Oh, goodness. Top you're notch. Too, you're too kind. No, you're too kind. no, I speak only the truth. But it was a delicious dinner. We had a lot of really delicious beer, playful banter, and uh, incredible food. So it was a really special evening, and I hope that uh, the people that were with us enjoying it uh, as guests will remember it as long as I do. It's a wonderful time, a wonderful festival, a wonderful dinner. Everything about this weekend in Breckenridge is great every single year. So I, I have, it's, it's been a favorite of mine. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad we could sit down and talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, here. I'm glad, too. And uh, today was an epic powder day. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> believe my luck. I get, I get one day to snowboard in Colorado a year, pretty much, and uh, turns out it was You got magic. out there on a first chair, so you got some uh, some good, clean powder, huh? I was out at 8.37, so I was out pretty early, yeah. and uh, yeah, I hit. I went all the way from, uh, uh, what are we at, peak nine here, all the way over to six, and uh, got all sorts of freshness over there nice. as well, and it was nice. fantastic. It was great. We uh, we didn't get out there until about noon, and it was pretty choppy by the time we got. Oh out yeah, there, it got but... pretty rough. Yeah, yeah, still fun. Still fun. Still Absolutely. fun. Got a good workout. Indeed. Oh, my thighs are jelly. But uh, <laughs> I'm about to crack open one of my two favorite Opre drinks right now. All right. And this is Dogfish Head Sea Quench. It is uh, filled with all sorts of goodness. You're have that to pour will, me some there too. That will restore um, the feeling to your legs. Now, we should probably say the FDA has not verified these uh, health benefit claims. Oh, no. <laughs> not at all. This is an alcohol product. And so, uh, yeah. Um, so tell me about this beer. This is uh, something that you guys have uh, spent a lot of time uh, putting pulling together and created a, a very interesting brewing process around. Um, you know, from what you've been telling me, it's a, it's a multi-threaded beer that then comes together in a very specific way in order to achieve, uh, you know, the kind of balanced flavor that you've built out of it. So tell me, tell me a little bit about this. All right. So there are, there's a lot of story behind this beer, um, in Rehoboth beach, Delaware, which is where dogfish head was founded. We operate two restaurants. One of them is our original brew pub called brewings and eats. And the other is a coastal seafood centric, um, and a craft cocktail centric uh, restaurant called Chesapeake in Maine, which draws inspiration from Maine, which is where Dogfish Head is actually right, located, right. and the Chesapeake Bay region, which is where we are located. Um, so when you we say bring, Dogfish Head. This is like a point off of outside of Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. That's correct. You know, and, and out in the ocean, and that, that that's the spot that the brewery has been named after. Indeed, indeed, that is true. Um, so. It's uh, very much seafood centric, and uh, we specialize in oysters. We have our own proprietary oyster called Smoke on the Water. Proprietary with, oyster. Uh, yeah, so it's this oyster, and uh, originally for the restaurant, we were going to uh, try to make um, hop flavored oysters. Huh. 
Um, however, when the, uh, the hop essence or hop oil was added to the, uh, the water where the oysters were growing, they clamped up and they wouldn't take it in. You can't blame them. Yeah. Yeah. So, they don't um, have the same taste for hops that we do. That's so true. But in a, in a really, uh, inspired moment, um, the thought was had to put smoked salt into the water huh. and they have zero problem taking that in. And in doing so in filtering that smoked salt water, they become themselves smoky. So what you end up with is a raw oyster that is, well, tastes like it's been smoked. Interesting. But it's, not, it's totally delicious. Anyway, the uh, the beer um, that we're drinking here, Sea Quench, was originally formulated just for uh, Chesapeake and Maine and specifically to be paired with the smoke on the water oyster oh. as well as the rest of your seafood dinner. But right. that was like kind of the, uh, the launching point for this beer. Um. It became very, very popular, of course, because it's really <laughs> delicious. Um, and, uh, you know, all of our beers are inspired by the culinary world. And uh, this beer is no exception, not not only with the oysters, but also there are some really uh, unique um, culinary ingredients in this beer. Um, the most uh, important one, well, not most important one, but kind of the weirdest one, the most famous one are the uh, the black limes. Um, which are also known as Persian uh, limes, which mm -hmm. are these dried limes that are black and dry and intensely limey, and they're really mm -hmm. quite delicious. And that's one of the major fl flavor components in in this beer. Um, in addition to that, uh, you mentioned that it's brewed in three threads. Um, the first thread that is brewed is a kettle soured goza. Um, the uh, the salt that goes into that goza was um, was uh, built for us by the uh, National Aquarium in Baltimore, and it was designed to mimic the salt content in the Chesapeake Bay. Huh. Um, so originally we were going to try to use Chesapeake Bay salt, um, not the cleanest yeah, bay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when the uh, the water was uh, evaporated and the salt was left behind, it was. Uh, not so pleasant. Right. So what we have is a perfect representation of what the salt would be like if the water was absolutely pristine. Interesting. So uh, that's one cool fact uh, fact about this beer. Um, so the second thread that we brew for this is a kettle soured um, Berliner Weiss, which also gets the uh, the black limes and some lime juice as well. And then the third beer that's brewed for it is a Kolsch. And uh, those are brewed in sequence. Brew number one is the Goza. Brew number two is the Kolsch. Brew number three is uh, brew number two is the Berliner. Brew number three is the Kolsch. And then they all end up in the same fermenter and ferment together with uh, a single uh, strain. It's a Kolsch ale strain. That seems like an incredibly complex way to get to an, an, an end result. Uh, what, from that kind of brewing process, why did you choose to do it that way rather than brewing one beer and then kettle souring it in order to accomplish uh, you know, the same kind of thing. So through our R&D process, we did try to brew a recipe of it to arrive at that flavor. Um, it tasted okay. It felt inauthentic mm. and uh, didn't necessarily capture the spirit of the original beer that was brewed for the Chesapeake and Maine restaurant. So it's the only way that this beer can be made. So what, you know, in terms of those differences, like sensory wise, what, what do those differences taste like? Um, and what is, does blending those different recipes allow you to accomplish in, from a sensory perspective? Sure. So, I mean, they all, all three have different grists, of course, um, and they have different grain, well, obviously different grain bills, but, um, the, uh, the components of the grists are, uh, are, are varied, um, Honestly, it's it's just kind of magic. <laughs> it's not really magic. Um, it's magic, All right? <laughs> we we it just doesn't taste right, huh? Yeah, there's really no way I can further describe it other than it it's just not sequench, huh? Yeah. Uh, so how do you envision a beer, you know, with multiple threads, and then you know, uh, I'm trying to you know reverse engineer this process sure thinking about how to you know i mean do you envision the final product and exactly what you want to taste like and then go back to it or do you does it build from the various things where 
you know, you're going through an iterative process and saying, you know, I wish we could do this a little bit you know, differently and soften this or, or punch this up or sharpen this. And then, you know, think about how you could do that, whether it's for, through one recipe or then through this blending process. When you start talking about, you know, three different threads, you know, thinking multivariately like that around recipe design gets infinitely more complex. Um, you know, for a brewer, like you're, you know, you, there's so many different factors that can interact with each other and, and you know, of course, change. Uh, you know, and uh, influence, uh, you know, those elements of the other things. How do you, how do you, I mean, I'm trying to wrap my head around how you even go through that mental process to, to figure it out. Certainly small changes in each recipe have an impact on the overall sensory uh, yeah. experience, um, not just in aroma, flavor, but also mouthfeel. Um, you know, through uh, a variety of iterations, we found it to be too sharp. You know, there's a coriander component in it that, you know, it's there, but it needs to be subtle. So at one point that needed to be uh, pulled back. So there, there were a number of iterations through, um, through our brew pub, uh, brewery at the time we didn't have our, uh, our actual R and D brewery, uh, operational yet, but, um, yeah, so it really started with an idea and then we built up from that and then we got to a certain point and pulled back and pushed forward and, just a lot of tasting and trying and uh, thinking and doing. Now, Dogfish has is known for uh, the breadth of ingredients that you all push into beers. Um, you all, in a lot of ways, have been pioneers of bringing new ingredients. And uh, I think we can, you know, most of the beer industry could blame you for uh, the adjunct craziness and uh, all the fruit that's everywhere now. And maybe not blame, but... Uh, credit uh to sure. some degree for uh, you know uh, for pushing this idea you know of new exciting interesting and uh, uh maybe a little bit out of uh the mainstream ingredient ideas in beer uh, where how does where, where does that inspiration come from and uh how do you then uh, you know think about things uh, like the kind of coriander that you might put here into sequench so um Ideas and inspirations come from everywhere. Certainly, we are inspired by the culinary, culinary world quite a bit, and we draw ingredients from that world. Um, and through our daily lives, we smell things, we taste things, we seek things out. And um, through the, uh, the thought process of a, a brewer, you apply those uh, sensory experiences to what might happen within the flavor matrix of beer. Um, when we go about using uh, new and exciting ingredients to create new flavor um, profiles in beer, the one thing that's most important to us is it has to be beer first. And the, uh, the ingredient that we're adding to it is a component of that beer flavor. You know, it can't be just that flavor yeah you know it needs to be a balanced uh beautiful experience or else it'll be well it'll be kind of jarring and um it just won't be memorable you know it needs to be you need to have a, a deft touch in bringing these ingredients into the uh, into the into the beer and you need to have a good reason for bringing it into the beer not just to do it or throw an idea against the wall you need to be uh, we're very thoughtful in how we approach um, recipe development as well as uh, building flavor profiles around um, beer. Um, we bring the world of wine into our beer making as well and um, the world of, uh, well, cooking. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, a lot goes into what we do. And um, first and foremost, we're, we're, we're very thoughtful about it. What does that evaluation process look like? I mean, do you all, you know, look at multiple, uh, you know, providers and where, I mean, because it, it's a little different than you going down to a farmer's market and, you know, finding some cool thing that somebody may, I mean, you're making beer at a scale where you can't do that, where you also need to be able to source in, a, in enough quantity that you can actually use it. And so you, you know, you need to find a commercial provider for some of these things that may be a little bit out of the mainstream and harder to, harder to get. Um, Indeed. But then, then you're, you know, how do you go through that process of evaluating, you know, whether that's going to give you the, the same th you know, kind of feel or input as the, that ingredient that a chef might've used that inspired you in the first place to even go down that road. 
Um, so we have an amazing coworker named Chad who uh, is in ingredients procurement, and uh, it is his uh, his main objective to find um, uh, good sources for amazing ingredients for our beers. Um, as we're developing recipes in R and D, we look very closely at the scalability of those recipes, and um, we could make a decision on day one as to whether or not we're going to move it forward in the development process. Um, if we find an ingredient that is just going to be ridiculously and outlandishly expensive, and we'll push push the uh, the price point of a widely launched beer uh, above what the consumer is uh, willing to bear, um, then we probably won't go down that route. Yeah, um, it's not going to stop us from making it on a small scale, so we can experience it with our guests and our coworkers um, in Delaware. So let's go back to sequence a little bit. This, uh, you know, sequence is is fermented with a Kolsch yeast. Um, tell me a little bit about that, and why you made that decision, and uh, you know what you do to kind of steer that that ester component of that yeast in the in the right direction to to give you the beer that you're looking for here. Sure. So the decision was made to uh, use a, a German yeast strain. Um, you know, we took all of the inspiration for this beer from German brewing. Yeah, and. Um, it only made sense to use a, a German ale strain to uh, to ferment this beer. I mean, we were looking for a yeast strain that has a really clean um, flavor profile, mm-hmm. so it's not too terrifically estery. Um, it ferments dry, and it ferments um, thoroughly and reliably. And uh, really the way we arrive at that is just good yeast management. Uh, we work very closely with our microbiologist in-house, uh, along with our, our coworkers on the uh, the brewing floor and the rest of our, our QC uh, QA QC uh, coworkers to ensure that our yeast is healthy, our yeast pitching rates are correct, so that we arrive at um, uh, uh, predictable, uh, repeatable, yeah, um, delicious fermentation. One of the things I like about this beer is that the uh, you know the acidity is there, but it's very soft and it's very um, approachable, and it and it does, it's not overwhelming, but it still gives it a little bit of, a little bit of tang and a little bit of you know uh, I wouldn't even call it bite because it's not that that intense, but uh, um, you know puts a uh, you know nice finely creased edge around the beer. Surely um, it is soft and it's balanced, and I think that's the most important thing about this beer is that you know the salt is balanced with. Uh, the tartness, which is balanced with uh, some of the malt sweetness, and everything comes together to make it a pleasant drink. Mm-hmm. And, and there's there's no shame in p- being pleasant. Absolutely not. <laughs> what what um, how, how much acidity ends up in the in the finished beer? Uh, in terms of TA, I don't remember off the top of my head, Fair. and I apologize yeah. for no, that. No, that's okay. I can follow up with an email. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know about what pH it gets down to? The pH is in the uh, the low to mid threes. Oh, okay. Well, it, it doesn't actually taste uh, like it might be there, and which is sure. Uh, uh, I mean, you can have a TA of one, and the pH will still be three point right. two. So, I mean, it's not uh, TA is not a linear relationship right. with pH. Right. So that's that's pretty much why. <laughs> No, for sure, and we've we've written about that in Craft Beer Brewing Magazine. There's some, there's there's plenty of uh, of scholarship on that that Surely. hopefully explains that that difference between pH and TA. But indeed, yeah. Um, well, let's talk about another beer. Okay, you brought another beer, you know, for us to drink. But actually, before we do that, before we do that, and uh, I've got one more sponsor, uh, you know, to acknowledge here, uh, and it's a great and timely one given our talk about ingredients. Uh, great beers are made from select ingredients, and with BSG, you'll bring the world to your brew house with an unparalleled and diverse selection of ingredients from across the globe to just down the road. Their dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the experience you need in every step of the way. Let BSG be your supplier of choice for products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. For more information, visit them at bsgcraftbrewing.com or give them a call at 1-800-374-2739. All right. Good people over there at the BSG. Absolutely. Um, tell us about this next beer. It's a howdy beer. Howdy from beer. The post. Yes. From your previous uh, brewing game. From my previous life. So you were the prodigal's dogfish head's prodigal son, and you were there, oh, and you worked, and you left. And Can you people did see you else? blush on podcasts? Can you see blushing on podcasts? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Um, 
yeah, so it was a really important part of my career path to, um, you know, uh, I left Dogfish Head in 2011 to pursue a career in graphic design. It was something I was super interested in. And I went back to school and uh, built on my BFA. I have a bachelor's in fine arts and painting. And I built on that with um, with a degree in graphic design. And I went into uh, web design. Uh, the first year was pretty great. It was new. I was learning a lot of stuff. And the second year I spent 75% of the time looking for a way to get back into the brewing industry. <laughs> All right. I always kept a foot in the door. I kept uh, con- consulting gigs going <laughs> yeah. while, I was, while I was graphic designing. So I always had a foot in the door, which was great. Um, but in 2013, I found a really cool opportunity to partner with the Big Red Efra restaurant group here in Colorado to um, start uh, a fried chicken uh, centric beer uh, brew pub and who <laughs> you can't really go wrong with that yeah um, and I came in on the ground floor and was uh, had the opportunity to build a really cool little brewery in Lafayette and uh, develop a, a beer program that um, is primarily comfort beer you know we were making comfort food and to go along with comfort food you need beer that is also you know, Top class, uh, world class, and delicious and well crafted, but feels familiar and is right for that environment. So, tell me about that going from Dogfish Head brewing on a much larger scale to then getting down to brew pub scale at the post. Uh, what was that challenge like, and what were you able to to take from what you'd learned at a larger and that larger production scale and apply it to uh, to that small brewery? So from 2002 until 2011, I learned a lot of really important lessons about building quality into your brewing program from the very beginning. So um, the first things that I purchased for the brewery were lab equipment and um, really established um, uh, internal procedures for monitoring microbiological stability of the beer, uh, physical attributes of the beer, and uh, generally just making a portfolio for each beer that included, um, you know, our tolerances for micro hits on plates, uh, IBUs, colors, ABVs, et cetera. And um, really uh, built a just brand metrics that were things that we uh, were goals that we had and they were things that we could always improve on. And, uh, you know, we learned the hard way, at Dogfish by trying to fit quality a quality assurance program into an already existing brewery. And I really didn't think that was too pleasant to do just because there was resistance and pushback to uh, to that, even even from myself. And I was mm. responsible for partly for yeah. bringing that into the uh, into the brewery. Um, so I just wanted it to be part of the, the culture of the brewery to uh, have quality be, you know, the first thing you think of when you come to work or when you sit down and drink the beer. It's always quality, quality first. What, uh, you know, you mentioned these, uh, you know, key points and tolerances. What, what do you, you know, define as, uh, those, you know, key performance indicators or key metrics that, uh, uh, you know, that are important for you to track to know whether the beer is doing the right thing all along the process. Um, and we think we try to think about this, I mean, and talk to other you know professionals about it because there are, you know, I believe there was a you know, German brewing group that did a, an interesting study where they found that, uh, you know, they're tracking something like 120 different metrics, uh, you know, along through that brewing process, but decisions were only made on, a, you know, maybe 12 or 14 of those. And so, you know, if you're tracking a whole bunch of things that don't really matter and don't really have an impact on the beer, uh, and how you brew, then, uh, uh, it's uh, not really, you know, a good use of your time. But what are, I'm just curious from your perspective, like what are the what are the most important things to keep track of? Um, for me, in well, in that brewing program, um, obviously, uh, were, uh, density uh, was important to track. Um, pH was always critical, um, and that was uh, mash pH all the way through finished beer yeah. pH. Um, we uh, were tracking uh, uh, hop utilization in the kettle, uh, which was something that we were, which gave us actionable data uh, for decision making. Um, 
uh, obviously carbonation and then also micro was uh, pretty huge especially uh post filter post uh bright tank carbonation uh micro was uh those were some critical points where we were able to find some uh some some problems with our with our process and huh. make improvements to uh to mitigate the risk of having uh micro hits in that place <laughs> Now, if, if I recall, um, you also worked on materials handling in that brewery and uh, you know, making sure that your malt was conveyed in a... Indeed. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about those, those processes and what you find with, uh, you know, in something simple as, you know, crushing and transporting your grain into the, the, the mash tun in a, a soft and gentle way. You, know, you, have, you have a reputation. <laughs> it sounds like we've talked about this before. <laughs> no, I've heard you talk about it before. Okay, Not cool. to me, but... Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, you know, it's something um, that some brewers don't necessarily consider in their process. And, uh, you seem to have some pretty strong opinions about it. I do. Um, once your malt is crushed, be as gentle with it as humanly possible. Um, you know, in that, in that, in the, in the post, uh, space, space was pretty limited for malt handling. Um, so I squeezed in a whole bunch of stuff, um, uh, to make it, um, gentle on the, uh, the malt and, um, give us, um, in the mash tun, what we expected to get into the mash tun every time. So, um, one of the, uh, the critical things that I put in place there is for transferring, um, the grist from the grist case into the mash tun after it's the malt's been crushed. I put a chain and disc conveyor in there and, um, that ensured that we would have uh, less than a half percent state change from the, uh, the grist case into the mash tun, which is a ne- negligible, um, amount of state change. Mm-hmm. So what was coming out of the mill is what was going into the mash tun. And so this way through monitoring, um, state change, what, what, what does that consist of? State change means, uh, uh, when you're transferring the malt, uh, you have the husk material. Are you breaking the husk material mm-hmm. up a little bit more? So it's going from a state of being mostly whole to a state of being broken into little teeny tiny pieces. Yeah. Um, so we were evaluating our crush and, um, sending it into the mash tun and monitoring the brew house performance with the crush. We can see what our efficiency was, make adjustments to the, the mill without having to worry about what a flex auger might do to our grist after the grain's been crushed, simply because those are terrible for crushed malt. And so you know, you've also tried to minimize the amount of, you know, that uh, that crushed grain will fall at any point. Um um, well, it would fall from the uh, the mill into the bottom of the grist case, and I mean that was a very yeah. that was a very small uh, amount of uh, of it didn't fall very yeah. far. Yeah. But um, we t- I tried to minimize the amount of times we needed to manipulate the malt after it's been moved from moved um, through the mill to ensure that we have uh, uh, predictable runoffs and predictable and repeatable extract recovery yeah. in the kettle. So at the post. You uh, you started with your small brew house and you you designed these recipes, but uh, one one thing you ultimately did was scale those recipes for larger production and packaging using an outside contract brewer, Sleeping Giant, in Indeed. Denver. Tell me a little bit about uh, you know how you built a framework for them to 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 also make these beers for you, and uh, you know both why you guys decided to make that decision to go big with it. And then how you manage that as a brewer, because, sure. you know, people don't know Sleeping Giants making the beer, you know, they see your brand on it and, uh, you know, they expect it to be the way that you, and, and I imagine you as a brewer, you know, with the pride that you have in your work, you want that beer that comes out in the can with your brand on it to, to taste exactly like you want it to. Yeah. And that's exactly, I, the way I approached, um, contract brewing, um, was just as I was putting beer out there with my name on it. Um, even though it says you know, post brewing company, howdy beer, Western Pilsner, it still has my name on it. And I'm still, uh, fiercely protective of all of the, uh, the brand attributes that it has. And the way that made, it made it a lot easier to approach sleeping giant with, uh, with our beers is that since we built a lab in Lafayette from the get go, we were able to, uh, establish, uh, brand standards for, uh, for howdy beer, as well as the other beers that we would be producing there. And that gave me a document for each brand that I could present with the contract brewer, um, for ingredient selection, uh, process parameters, um, tolerances for starting gravity, finished gravity tolerances for IBUs, pH, um, uh, VDK levels, um, VDK being a uh, diacetyl. Right. Um, we'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, sure. Um, 
And uh, what that gave me was a tool uh, which I could use to uh, hold Sleeping Giant accountable for mistakes that had been made, but also as um, a, a piece of uh, a tool to uh, enable them to uh, more easily find success in their own in their own uh, business, uh, making beer for other people. Um, so there was a lot of process improvement that went on, uh, early on with, uh, with Howdy Beer, as well as, uh, Towny Ale, which was the other beer that we produced with them at the time. And, um, it wasn't always pretty, but I always had the document that said, this is what it says, this is what it needs to be. And that's what it states in the contract. Uh, it had to be an interesting one for them to work with someone who had operated an even larger scale production brewery than they operate. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I I came out of that relationship with some really good friends. Uh, yeah. So that, that, and and some uh, there are some really, really smart people that work there that I can also use as resources because they know a lot of stuff that I don't know, which is uh, important. So, yeah, it was, a, well, it was so, good. So I, about, and I had, yeah. I had to learn a lot of stuff about myself um, entering into a relationship with a contract brewery yeah. as well. I mean, there's... I had always such a stigma on it, mm-hmm. which I don't think there should be. But uh, at first, it was a huge mental hurdle for me to get over um, and just do it. So, so what, what was that hurdle? Like, why? What is? And there, you're right. There is that stigma, and it does feel like you know using a contract brewery, which you know are are just more skilled professionals with their own yeah you know their their own plant for brewing, and uh, uh, you know, and you as a uh, the contractor. Um, you know, have, have varying levels of oversight on that. You sure. obviously give them standards, but you're all, you know, I imagine there as you're developing those beer, getting those beers dialed in on the system, you can be present there and, and participate in that. Um, you know, wh- why does that stigma exist? And, uh, you know, what do you, why do you think it shouldn't exist? For me, for me, the mental hurdle existed simply because I'm at the core, I'm a maker of things. And, um, and I'm a bit of a control freak. Yeah. And um, deep down, I always feel like if I say I made something, I made it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I needed to uh, get over myself, for lack of a better way to put it, and um, trust that there are professionals out there that can do it for me. Uh, and really, I just thought of it as my title is brewmaster at the Post Brewing Company. This is a brew. This is my production brewery here at Sleeping Giant, and th- this is how we're making this beer. Now I've got extra hands to make larger quantities of beer, and I've got all of this world class equipment making yeah. the beer that we otherwise couldn't afford. So I mean, it was important for me to be very hands on in every batch of beer that went through there to uh, get reports from Sleeping Giant from brew house performance reports, um, all the uh, all the uh, quality performance metrics that I was looking for, and uh, just to pay attention to them and uh, I think about the, the you know this issue with contract brewing yeah, you know, in, in such a way like we you know we produce a magazine and we don't actually print the magazines you know because to print a magazine uh, it takes a press that starts at about six million dollars yeah and you know with this issue, you know with the the margins of the printing industry I mean you have to keep that stuff running twenty four hours a day every you know every hour it's down costs thousands of dollars and so you know um, the only efficient way efficient way for anyone to, to operate that kind of, you know, high capital investment equipment is to keep it running a lot. Um, you know, and so naturally we, you know, print with a, a, you know, a printer in the upper Midwest and, you know, they, you know, we send the magazine, but they're very good at what they do. And they, they uh, do a much better job of printing, you know, a ma- high quality magazine at a price point that we can afford than, uh, you know, we could try to do it any other kind of way. Um, you know, does that make what we produce not authentic or not made by us? No, you no. know, it, you know, it is the, still the product that, you know, that we put out there is made by us. And so, uh, you know, with, with, in the brewing industry, and I think this is going to become an increasingly, uh, important problem the brewers face, you know, even last year, I, I believe that that Delta, uh, in capacity between, uh, you know, how much brewers were brewing and in actual beer production, and how much capacity that they had to brew was something you know, it grew to almost like forty percent. Like this is a major amount that 
craft brewers have invested in capital investment and equipment mm-hmm. to brew beer that's not being used. Right. And, you know, and so that's hugely inefficient, a gigantic waste uh, uh, of money that ultimately hits the bottom lines of those brewers. And so, you know, thinking in this kind of way of co oping together, you know, using you know, that kind of existing uh, capacity at another brewery rather than just building your own you know, duplicate of that kind of thing in order to, to do this thing just so that you can have this, some idea that this is your thing that you made. Uh, it seems like it might be a bad idea and that, that contract <laughs> brewing, yeah, you know, and, and, and contract brewing in sense of using a dedicated contract brewer like Sleeping Giant that's only a contract brewer or contract brewing in the sense of alternating proprietorships with, you know, between breweries that, uh, you know, where one brewery that has that excess capacity can brew beer for another brewery. I mean, these seem like smart ways to solve this problem of, right. of you know, all of this inefficient uh, capital investment. Surely. I mean, having a brewery dedicated solely to contract brewing for me is better because I know that their intentions are more in line with their intentions are more aligned with my own yeah. um, because their success depends on our success Yeah, and they need to be on board with our quality standards and right. they need to be able to perform to those quality standards. If you have excess capacity at a brewery down the street and they're not making their own beer, they're making somebody else's beers. You really need to be assured that their quality um, standards are in line with yours as well and that yeah. they're willing to meet those standards. And if they're not willing to meet those standards, you should probably look elsewhere. Uh, tell me a little bit about this beer, Howdy Beer. Our blind judges uh, rated it, I think, a 97 in Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. That's, that's not bad. It's not bad. That's a pretty <laughs> darn good Pilsner. Um <clears throat> Uh, you know, but you call this a Western Pilsner, or I say you originally called this. Now they're brewing it without you, but it's still one of your favorite beers. And uh, um, yeah, so um, I was I was I was listening to some of your podcasts, and I saw another brewer was talking about making Pilsners outside of the German and uh, Czech um, tradition, and um, I share the same opinion as that. Um, while I love well-crafted German Pilsners and Czech Pilsners and what have you, um, we have a whole range of amazing ingredients that are being produced here in the U.S. by U.S. farmers that um, can turn out some pretty damn good Pilsner beers. So um, this beer focuses on U.S.-grown barley malt and U.S.-grown hops. So it's all... um, uh, it, all the barley for the malt is grown in Colorado and Montana, hmm. and the hops all come from the Yakima Valley of Washington. And it's just um, two-row barley malt and uh, Palisade hops, and that's pretty much it. That seems pretty simple for uh, something that's... Uh... Uh, simplicity is like <laughs> the greatest, isn't it? It is. You know, uh, it, that's an interesting point, and I hear this... You know, every time we put a podcast out there, a new story, you know, we tend to hear from the folks that have differing opinions to that. And, um, you know, we try to take the approach here of not telling you what's right or what's wrong, but listening to brewers and their varying uh, approaches, philosophies and techniques around these kinds of things. Sure. And I find beauty. I find as much beauty in, you know, the process that, uh, you know, Bill and Ashley at Bierstadt Lagerhouse put into their, you know, very finicky, very uh, tightly controlled processes that are very historical and driven. Uh, and, and they produce fantastic beers that way. And then I love, at the same time, the approach of uh, uh, Swifty and Amos at uh, ABGB, who don't do any of that. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> do it in a completely different way. And uh, still win, you know, crazy amounts of medals at GABF, you know, for, for their uh, their Pilsners. And so, sure. you know, I think what it speaks to in the world of brewing is that there's not one way to do this. You know, there are a whole lot of different ways. And a lot of those different ways are all valid. And a lot of those are... You know, come down to the the, the uh, auteurship of the brewer and how they want to proceed and how they want to make beer. You know, and, and uh, those kinds of beers they want. That's to right. And uh, what we what we put into beer making as uh, as producers, you know, we're responsible for setting um, consumer expectations, and you know, we all have our own ways of doing things, and each of those methods have their own little idiosyncrasies. But we're defining our brand as our brand and we're saying hey consumers this is what we're giving you and uh we're going to do everything in our power to make it this way and give you the experience that you expect every time you come to this 
this drink. Um, so there's no right way or wrong way to do it. Um, unless I would say there are a lot of wrong ways <laughs> and there are a lot of right ways. <laughs> I don't think there are any no. wrong ways. All right. All there right. are no wrong ways. Um, you know, like I said, you're, you're setting your own yeah. expectations and you're telling your own brand story. And if I think your way is absolutely ridiculous, that's perfectly fine. Cause it's working for, for you. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. really matter. Well, you know, and if your if your consumers enjoy the beer, then uh, it's hard to say that it's that's not right. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing because yeah. they're keeping the lights on. You know, they're giving you feedback um, to make decisions, to make beer better, to do whatever. So, so then with a beer like Howdy Beer, simple beer, simple grists, you know, very simple hops. Um, how do you? What sets this part? Why is this beer so good? Um. <laughs> Uh, what makes it so good is the is the simplicity. Okay. I mean, it's a very clean beer, and it uh, celebrates all the beauty that the American ingredients bring to it. There's uh, just this nice, bready um, malt sweetness that it has. That it has a nice, sharp, clean bitterness, and um, just wonderful, uh, fruity and spicy uh, hop aromas and flavors. And I think it just delivers the total package of what... I'm looking for in Pilsner beer, and thankfully there are other people out there that are looking for similar attributes in a Pilsner beer, especially an all-American Pilsner beer. So this, you know, when you when you left Dogfish Head and, and then went through your time in the wilderness and then came back to the post, uh, you took a very decidedly undogfish approach to brewing at that post. And, uh, you know, by focusing on these small beers, these more drinkable beers, uh, I shouldn't say more drinkable, I should say uh, more sessionable, lower ABV, more simple, uh, fewer uh, outrageous ingredients, you know, less uh, uh, of the, the spectacle, you know, that dogfish has always embraced. Um, you know, what led that kind of uh, approach and why did you decide to go that way, especially in the midst of a brewing industry that was increasingly uh, pushing out on those creative edges. I had a different story to tell. Um, you know, the, uh, the post brewing company was, and still is its own story, you know, fried chicken, simple beer. And I honestly, um, when when I left Dogfish Head, I had actually transitioned from um, managing production to doing small scale brewing at our brew pub for the last two years or so of my uh, my first time there. Um, and to keep the lines filled with beer, I was making Pilsner and I was making <laughs> very simple um, English style bitters and and what have you. And uh, you know, guests responded favorably to that. Um, you know, we have the ability to offer this broad range of, uh, of beers at Dogfish. And um, I've brought my love for simple, small beers back to Dogfish with me. And now we are um, producing those there as well. So yeah. on a small scale. Well, it's a, it's an interesting story and such an interesting one to see you all balancing, uh, you know, both both sides of that beer coin. I I. I I love a lot of things, and uh, thankfully, I have some level of skill at delivering on those. So, um, let's uh, let's talk about brewing a little bit more. Uh, I'm curious, from your you know professional perspective, uh, what do you think are some of the most you know more important uh, factors in that brewing process that maybe not as many brewers focus on that they should focus on? You know, are there some of those unseen things out there in you know, in that brewing process that have an outsized impact on uh, the you know the quality of beer that comes out? Uh, you know that people ought to pay more attention to. Mm. There are there are um, brewing blindly uh, is uh, is a bit of an issue, I suppose. You know, not looking at your yeast ever yeah uh, is a is a pretty big issue um just because uh if you want a predictable flavor profile from your yeast and you expect your yeast to be done fermenting at a specific time and you want to increase your chances of finding that success you should probably do yeast cell counts and viability 
staining and all of that good stuff. Yeah. Um, further uh, into that world of yeast, uh, wort aeration is uh, something that is just kind of like, let's go. Um, <laughs> you know, let's just get some oxygen in there. But um, there's a pretty interesting uh, episode of the uh, Master Brewers podcast about uh, wort aeration yeah. and uh, a brewery that was struggling with some fermentation issues and uh, it came down to uh, um, wort aeration and it describes the steps that they took to uh, dial in what they needed to give their particular yeast strains uh, in terms of uh, oxygen to uh, to grow in a healthy way in a predictable manner. Hmm. Um, what else is overlooked? pH is also overlooked quite a bit. Uh, and the importance of it is um, it determines a whole lot of things from, you know, malt flavor, yeast performance, um, uh, overall stability of the beer, flavor, stability, microbiological stability. There are a lot of uh, factors, uh, a lot of things impacted by pH, both in the world of uh, mash and wort production, as well as uh, fermentation and finished beer uh, presentation. Yeah, and then we were talking about diacetyl. Diacetyl. That, yeah. So diacetyl, this diacetyl is an issue that you are passionate about. Well, passionate. I'm very sensitive to diacetyl, and okay. I find it unpleasant uh, in beer yeah. um, most of the time. Uh, 99% of the time, I find it unpleasant. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> it's one of the uh, – we were talking about some of the uh, the quality metrics that – uh, I paid attention to at the post brewing company as uh, being key metrics that I paid attention to, and um, <clears throat> it was uh, it was important for us to uh, to run tests on all of our beers um, before you know crash cooling or before harvesting yeast or dry hopping, and diacetyl was always part of that um, series of tests that we would, uh, we would run and, uh, having those numbers were important for us moving into a contract relationship with sleeping giant because we could, uh, avoid, um, diacetyl laden swill coming out the other end. So, yeah. And you even gave a presentation at the craft brewers conference around this. Yes. So 2017, I think it was, I partnered with Nava Parker from, uh, white labs to, uh, present, um, uh, uh, on diacetyl from a brewer's perspective as well as from a scientific pr- perspective. Nava did the scientific part because she's smarter than me. <laughs> but but um, I presented it in terms of uh, just practical considerations as to what a brewer can do to avoid diacetyl issues, mm-hmm. um, talking about why we run diacetyl rests the way we run diacetyl rests, as well as uh, introducing people to an enzyme that enables brewers to um, reduce um, reduce diacetyl production through fermentation. So, you know, diacetyl happens, yeast produces acetolactic acid that chemically oxidizes into diacetyl. The yeast takes up that diacetyl and uh, converts it into um, flavor-neutral compounds, right? So yep. there's an enzyme that just goes from acetolactic acid to the flavor-neutral compounds and removes... No the, yeast involved. No yeast involved because the diacetyl generally isn't produced. Um However, it does not remove the need to uh, test for diacetyl. You always need to test. Absolutely. Always. Especially if it's something you've always tested for, you never stop. Unless you're not using that data. <laughs> if you're not using the data, stop doing the test. I'm, I'm curious uh, what you're now focusing on uh, you know, in terms of how do you keep pushing things forward for Dogfish Head? Now, you're in a role at, at Dogfish Head. Where you're doing some, uh, you know, designing some new beers, building some new things. Um, how how are you thinking about beer now? And what is, uh, you know, what are some of the, uh, you know, I wouldn't say trends, but some of the the, the things that are getting you excited, uh, and some of the things that you're learning as you continue to push this process forward and uh, you know uh, create new things. So I think that we've uh, we've proven to ourselves that we can find. A pretty high level of success with a low ABV, very drinkable, approachable beer, and that beer is Sequench, and um, that has given us the confidence internally to uh, focus some of our R and D efforts on uh, beers like that. You know, there's a pretty, there's a big emerging market for 
low ABV drinkable, sessionable beers. Right. And uh, which we, I guess is culturally different for you all coming from the 60, 90 minute IPAs oh, yeah. and the 18 percent, 120 minute IPAs and worldwide stout at huge kind of monster beer levels. And uh, Sure. And there's still a place for those beers. Right. Um not only in the market, but also in the dogfish story. Um, sure. And every everything that we do uh, just adds another chapter to that story for sure. Um, things that excite me most recently, um, I've been buying um, spices and stuff from uh, this company called Burlap and Barrel. Um, and the one ingredient that's really... Uh, tickled my tickle spot has been um, Your tickle spot <laughs> my, tickled my tickle spot. Ooh. <laughs> I didn't know it was that kind of podcast. Uh, what, uh, black Urfa chilies. So these are the other other um, these Turkish chilies that are um, dried in the sun, hmm. um, but they're dried in the sun uh, during the day and then they're covered over at night and so they kind of steam themselves they they're totally intense they're not hot they've got these beautiful cocoa and raisin like flavors they're lightly smoky and they bring a lot of really cool things to beer as well as to um poached eggs <laughs> <laughs> so you know i'm i'm bringing in these spices i'm trying them in beer i'm trying them on food to see what they do and yeah. try to bring all those worlds together yeah in a in a craft brewing market though you know you they're uh, that kind of risk taking is growing more common and you've got every from everyone from uh yeah, folks making milkshake IPAs with you know six different fruits added to them, and uh, you know, and it starts to become more common. It has to still be a challenge for you to think about ways to chart new territory in that. Surely, so I mean, we pay attention to a lot of those trends, and we know what's happening, and you know, it helps inform some decisions that we make. But um, at the heart of it, we have to define our own path. Yeah. And uh, and we need to have the courage to follow that. And that's what we're doing. For sure. For sure. So let's tell you a little bit about high-gravity brewing. We've talked about small beers. But sure. uh, uh, high-gravity brewing brings a whole slew of other challenges, especially when it comes down to yeast management and getting, right. getting those beers uh, you know, fermented at, uh, at big levels. Yeah. Um, we've been doing them for a while. Yeah. You guys have some knowledge on that. And the, the first trick, and we were, I was talking to Adam uh, Avery about this last night at the dinner. Um, you know, we really started doing it in 1999, which was three years before I started with Dogfish in the first place. Um, but when I came on board, it, it started to grow and grow. I mean, I think the third week of my time working there, the first time I had to make Worldwide Stout. And I said, how do I do that? <laughs> um, and then we've just been learning and learning and learning. And the first trick was to learn how to get the uh, yeast to do what we needed it to do yeah. um, in terms of alcohol production. And then the second trick was to figure out how to do that and make it um, taste like a really great beer and not just be um, a burning hot For sure. So thing. What, what could you share that's not proprietary around that uh, in how you managed to do that? Because uh, – I mean, it's still a challenge that uh, that home brewers and professional brewers alike face. Sure. So the most critical uh, part is uh, supplying the yeast with the oxygen that it needs to mm. grow, the cells that it needs to perform in those um, really adverse conditions. I mean, you've got a, a wort that is super high gravity to begin with, which uh, applies a lot of osmotic pressure on to the, uh, right. the yeast. And uh, we further disadvantage the yeast by putting it into really, really big tanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right. So, you know, we've got a 30-plus Play-Doh wort going into a 300-barrel tank that's going to apply a lot of pressure to that yeast. It's yeah. not going to be too psyched to be in there. So we need, to, we need to just find a way to make it do what it needs to do. So we need to supply the wort. We need to put enough yeast cells into the wort to begin yeah. with, and we need to give it the right amount of oxygen as well as the right nutrient package to uh, ensure uh, healthy cell growth to begin with. So, you know, in that, what is what does that look like? I mean, are you, uh, you know, in terms of cell counts, are you doubling a typical cell count? Or are you one and a half times your typical cell count? Uh, and then when, when you say giving them the right amount of oxygen, 
What does that look like? I mean, the general rule of thumb is X number of millions of cells right. per degree Plato. Um, so we've got definitely got a number for that. <laughs> And we definitely have a specific uh, uh, measurement of uh, wort dissolved oxygen going into the uh, into the fermenter. Okay. Um, We've got um, the right amount of zinc going in there. Zinc for sure, Mm -hmm. uh, which is an essential yeast nutrient. Um, What else? Do you use any enzymes to you know to support that? Uh, It's such an interesting thing. What was that now? Any enzymes? Yeah. What's that? (laughs) <laughs> enzymes are so hot right now, Brian. I mean, enzymes we, are hot, yes. We use enzymes now for brewed IPA and uh, no one, you know, blinks at it. No but one right? no one blinks so, at it. So it's totally okay to use enzymes now. Oh, there are enzymes for just about everything. Yeah. I, indeed. Indeed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I tried. <laughs> one of one of my favorite enzymes that, that I will uh push to the day that I die is um an enzyme that takes uh, acetolactic acid and turns it into 2,3-butanidione and acetylene and completely skips the diacetyl step. Huh. hey <laughs> So that's my favorite enzyme. All right. Yes. All right. Well, I, 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 I sense that I'm not going to get a whole lot more out of you there, but uh, are there any other... Uh, just, you know? just take good care of your yeast and give it what you think it needs to, uh, to perform in those... Uh, terrible conditions in that you're putting it in in a high gravity word a super high gravity word sure sure anything okay. anything above 21 plato i think in my book is super high gravity yeah uh so so what's next what's next um so we've got this really cool program that is helping us define what's next at the uh, at the brewery and it's called the beer exploration journal and uh we have it set up at both our milton brewery and uh at the rehoboth brewery And it's a way for us to engage our guests to gather direct feedback from them immediately after they have consumed a specific beer that we want to gather data on. And, um, you know, they they come, they taste the beer. We say, how did you like it? Will you please fill out a survey? And uh, they become part of our R&D decision-making team, which uh, which is a really powerful tool. You know, it's an interesting one. So um, we, we bring in we bring in data from Untapped, of course, because it's not invaluable data. Um, and quite honestly, what we're gathering from guests directly by requesting it is not too far too far off from what you see on Untapped as far as uh, guest um, opinion of your beer. Interesting. So you're seeing the same responses that they give you in the pub are generalized. Uh, they correlate to the what? averages for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? Huh. Averages so you're are saying, very close. You're saying then that there is There's, some, uh, you know, that Untapped may not be as crazy off as, as some brewers think it is. It is absolutely not. Huh. Yeah, it is. There's some, there's a good amount of validity in the numbers that you see on that website. That's interesting. Do you and, see And we, we seek that data directly from people that we're looking at and talking to. Mm-hmm. So it's not just an anonymous, you suck or this place is great because there's glitter in it. It's somewhat valid. Well, that makes sense. Well, is that the end? <laughs> <laughs> this is just like my Emmy speech where I was just going on and on and I heard the music and I just kept talking. Well, we could keep talking, but uh, you know, we have been talking for a while here on the podcast and Brian Saunders, I, we got to get you to dinner tonight. I appreciate you uh, talking with me. Here it is my pleasure. I uh, you know, appreciate you sharing what you could share. Well, thank you for occasionally uh, ca- dodging all of my other questions. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, <laughs> talking with me today. I really, it's really an honor for me to be uh, selected to talk to you about um, a subject that I'm very passionate about. So thank you very much. Very cool. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, also, thanks to this episode's sponsors. G&D Chiller is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling. Join your peers April 8th through 11th in Denver for the Craft Brewers Conference and Brew Expo America. And bring the world to your brew house with select ingredients from BSG. Awesome. Thanks for playing that. Thanks for joining me, Brian. Thanks for having me. Of course. Cheers. Cheers. Enjoy. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.